All right, pause the video, go put on your learning caps, and then come back because you really got to soak in this information. This video is about the invertible matrix theorem. Um, I kind of put my own spin on it because like I put more line items than you'll probably find in your textbook. But I use the invertible matrix theorem. When I took this class, I used it as like a great studying method because if you can prove to yourself why each line item implies the other line items, and you understand like fundamentally the invertible matrix theorem in that way, then you have a really good grasp on the concepts and the theory and stuff, and you'll do fine on the exams. So I really recommend using the invertible matrix theorem as a studying technique. Um, and hopefully this video helps you understand it better. So like you can put me on 1.75 speed, but don't put me on two speed because you really got to soak this stuff up. Okay, let's jump in. The invertible matrix theorem says that if you have some matrix A, that is n by n. So it has n rows and n columns. So A is a square matrix. Um, and also we're going to define a transformation T, T of X, uh, to be a, a linear transformation that has A as its standard matrix. So if you have a square matrix A and a transformation that has A as its standard matrix, then I'm going to write all, I'm going to write, I think, like 21 things. And they're all going to be equivalent. So if you can find one of these 21 things to be true, then the other 20 things are also true. Or, equivalently, if you find any one of these things to be false, then the rest are automatically false. And we're going to talk through why they imply each other in that way. So if you have a square matrix A, and let's just look at the first thing. If we're going to say the first thing is A is row equivalent, to the identity matrix, to the n by n identity matrix, right? So what does this mean, row equivalent? It means that you can get from A to I n by applying elementary row operations, right? We learned this in like the first couple videos. So if A is row equivalent to I n, then the following 20 things are going to be also true. Or if A is not equivalent to I n, then the following 20 things are also false. So we have this first one. So it's row equivalent to I n. That means that A is invertible. And why is that? Well, the way I think about it is, if you guys remember that process, I think it was just this last video, maybe two videos ago, that how do you find the inverse of a matrix? You put the matrix here, and then on the right half, you put the identity matrix. You row reduce all the way until the left half becomes the identity matrix. And then the, whatever you get on the right half will be A inverse. So the inverse. So if A is row equivalent to the identity matrix, then you can follow this process. You can put A here and I here, and you can row reduce until you get to I because it's row equivalent to the I identity matrix. And then the right half will be A inverse. So since you can row reduce all the way to I n, then A is invertible. You can find this A inverse by following this process. So that's one way to think about it. There's a, like a million different ways to explain this, but that's the way I think about it. And then uh, another thing that A being row equivalent to IN implies is that A is going to have N pivots. And the reason for that is how do you determine how many pivots a matrix has? Well, you take the matrix and you put it in reduced row echelon form, right? And then from that, you can identify where your pivot positions are and you can count how many pivots you have. And so if you take a, if you if you take it as true that a you can row reduce it all the way to i n, then i n how many pivots does it have? Well, i n remember is just a, a matrix with ones along the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So you would have n pivot positions. So like for example, you have this matrix one two three four, and through row reduction you can put it in reduced row echelon form, and trust me, you would get the identity matrix. And so since it's row equivalent to the identity matrix, it's going to have n pivots, in this case two pivots, right? Here they are. So hopefully that makes sense. And uh, if A has n pivots, so this one, this connection seems trivial, but it's important. If A has n pivots, you can say there's a pivot in every row. And I'm saying this because thinking about the fact that there's a pivot in every row can tell us a lot more useful things. Pivot in every row. Right? So if there's a pivot in every row, 
And that means AX equals B, this matrix equation, is always consistent. Hopefully you know this already from like a, a theorem earlier in the class. But just to remind you, if AX equals B is always consistent, or AX equals B is always consistent when you have a pivot in every row of A. Because like up here, for example, if we can row reduce to the identity matrix here, it doesn't matter what we have on the right hand side. Right? It doesn't matter what our B was. Because if we have a pivot in every row, that means it's impossible to have a pivot in the augmented column. So it's impossible for it to be inconsistent. So you can say, since there's a pivot in every row, AX equals B is always consistent. Okay. And uh, so the next thing, if A is N pivots and A is square, then that means, trivially, there's a pivot in every column as well. Right. That's got to make some good sense. But if there's a pivot in every column, what does that tell you in terms of free variables? That means there's no free variables. And, uh, and, and why is that? You guys should know this by now. It's because there's a free variable. Uh, uh, this is like the x1 column, the x2 column, for example. So like x2 would be a free variable if its column doesn't have a pivot, right? Since there's a pivot in every column, then there's no free variables. And if there's no free variables, then that means ax equals b has a unique solution. Right? It's when you have free variables that you're going to have infinitely many solutions, right? Because then you'd write the solution set in parametric vector form as in, in like where you would have, you would like factor out the free variables. And then since you can pick anything for the free variables, you'd have infinitely many solutions. But if you don't have any free variables, then AX equals B has a unique solution, right? It's always consistent. And since you have no free variables, your solution will be unique. Another way to think about this, right, the one way is to think no free variables. The other way is to think if A is invertible, if you have AX equals B and A is invertible, then can't I just left multiply both sides by A inverse? And what would I get? Well, this A inverse times A, remember, that's just equal to the identity matrix. And then the identity matrix times X doesn't change X. It's just like multiplying by one. So this would simplify to X equals a inverse B. And so for this matrix equation AX equals B, the solution X is just equal to, here it is, here's our unique solution, A inverse B. Right, so that's the second way to think about it. The first way is no free variables, so unique solution. The second way is, well, I can just left multiply both sides by A inverse and then get my unique solution. Okay, number nine, let's see. Okay, if AX equals B has a unique solution, what if our B was the zero vector? So what if I had AX equals zero? Well, this is in the form AX equals B, and so it's gonna have a unique solution. And uh, what is that solution? Well, the only way this is gonna be true, if you're only allowed one solution, it would mean you'd have to plug in zero for your X vector. So AX equals zero has a unique solution. And since this is zero over here on the right-hand side, X has to be zero. So this only has the trivial solution. So you remember talking about the different solutions to this is called the homogeneous equation. And the, the particular so solution where x equals the zero vector, we refer to that as the trivial solution. Because yeah, of course, if you pick x to be zero, ax equals zero is going to be satisfied. That's like kind of trivial, obviously, because a times x is a, a linear combination of the columns of a, right? And if you pick zero as the weights, if, if x is the zero vector, that means the weights of that linear combination are all zero. And so obviously, that's going to equal the zero vector. So you kind of call that trivial, quote unquote. But since AX equals B is a unique solution, AX equals zero's unique solution is trivial. So you say AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Right? And so what do we refer to? Pop quiz. What do we refer to the solution set to the homogeneous equation as? What is the, what's the special term for that? Well, the solution set to the homogeneous equation, we call it the null space of A, right? It's all the x's that satisfy AX equals zero. And so if we're saying all the only x that satisfies this is the where x is the zero vector, the trivial solution, then we can say that the null space of A is just equal to the zero vector, right? 
the set, the null space, is just equal to this one vector, the zero vector. It's the only vector that satisfies ax equals zero. And all the vectors that satisfy x equals zero, we call that the null space. So the null space is just the vector zero, okay? And we, uh, we can talk about the dimension of the null space, right? We've done that before in previous videos. The dimension of the null space of A, we have a special name for that. We call it the nullity of A. And uh, in this case, when the null space of A is just the, the point zero, the zero vector, what dimension is just a point? It's zero dimensional, right? So we can say the nullity of A is zero. It's a zero dimensional subspace of R. And uh, okay, so now let's change course and think about, let's go back up to uh, this guy, number five. So AX equals B is always consistent. So think about how A times X is defined to be a linear combination of the columns of A. So AX is defined to be a linear combination of the columns of A. And if up here we're saying that AX equals B is always consistent, it means no matter what B we put in here, we're gonna find an appropriate X to satisfy it, which means we'll be able to write any B in RN, obviously, as a linear combination of the columns of A, right? Because we're saying AX equals B is always consistent and A times X is defined to be a linear combination of the columns of A. So we can say for this 12th line item, we can say you can write any B that's a B vector in Rn as a linear combo of the columns of A, right? And now if you think about the definition of all of the linear combination of the columns of A, that's the span of the columns of A, right? So by definition, number 12 is saying that the span of the columns of A is Rn. Or you say the columns of A span Rn. That's just like the semantics. So if the span of the columns of A is Rn, we have a special term for the span of the columns of A, don't we? It's called the column span or the column space. So 14 is the column space of A equals Rn, right? Because the columns of A span Rn. That's the de Rn. That's the definition of column space. And uh, like we talk about the dimension of the null space, we also have a special term for the dimension of the column space. So 15 is the dimension of the column space of A. What's the special term for that? It's rank, right? The rank is the dimension of the column space. So the rank of A, if, if the column space is all of Rn, what dimension, what dimension is Rn? It's n dimensional, right? So the rank of A is n. So now quick check. Do you remember the rank nullity theorem? The rank of A plus the nullity of A has to equal the number of columns of A. So check the video on that if you're if you forget, but that's a theorem. The rank of A is n, the nullity of A is zero, so n plus zero equals n, and that's supposed to equal the number of columns of A. Well, it does, right? A is n by n, it has n columns. So that checks out, so we're on the right path, right? Um, number 16, this one's also gonna seem trivial, but it's gonna help us get uh, 17. If you have a pivot in every column, that means that you're, every column is a pivot column, right? So a pivot column is defined to be a column of the matrix, that has a pivot position in it. And so we can say, um, since there's n pivots, since there's n columns with n pivots, there are n pivot columns. Okay, I mean, that's, that's trivial, right? And if there are n pivot columns, do you guys remember how you find a basis for the column space of A? We made a video about this, and if you remember, the process is you, you row reduce A to determine, to reduce, to just row echelon form so you can see where are my pivots, where are my pivot columns. And then you, you identify them, you go back to the original A matrix and you take the corresponding columns and then those columns form a basis for the column space. But uh, if, the, if every single column of A is a pivot column, right, by 16, then that means every single column of A is a basis for the column space. So you can say the columns, 
of A form a basis for the column space of A. And do you remember a basis, the definition of a basis for a subspace is that the vectors span the subspace, but the vectors have to be linearly independent in a basis, right? For it to be a basis, the set of vectors has to be linearly independent. So the columns of A are a basis, that means the columns of A are linearly independent. The columns of A are linearly independent. And I could have I could have come to this conclusion, you know, much earlier. Like, let's see. I could have said AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. And so it's impossible, um, if you remember, to write a linear dependence relation among the columns of A, right? Because the weights are trivial in this case. And so I could say after 9, I could say the columns are linearly independent. Or I could say up here there's a pivot in every column, and so then the columns are linearly independent. So you can see how these are all so closely related. So now let's talk about, so we're almost done. Now let's consider up here, I had to find the transformation T to be to have a as its standard matrix. So if a is row equivalent to i n, or if any, if you identify any of these um, eighteen things to be true, then you could say t is one two one. Why is that? It's because remember, if if a transformation is one to one, that means its standard matrix has a pivot in every column. We've clearly identified there's a pivot in every column, and since it's square. And we've already even said there's a pivot in every row, but be, just a reminder, because there's a pivot in every column and it's square, that means there's a pivot in every row as well. So that would mean T is also onto. And then the last one, um, I'm going to hit you with this. The determinant of A doesn't equal zero. And a little intuition for this, do you remember if you want to find the inverse of, for example, a two by two matrix, uh, it's has this special formula ABCD inverse equals 1 over AD minus BC times and then you like flip these guys and do negatives there so this part here if you remember this is the determinant of A for a 2 by 2 matrix right and if the determinant of A equals 0 then you would have 1 divided by 0 times all this stuff and that gets turns into like a disaster, right? You can't divide by zero, obviously. So if the determinant equals zero, you're not gonna be able to find A inverse. So if the determinant equals zero, A is not invertible. And then equivalently, if the determinant of A doesn't equal zero, then A inverse does exist, A is invertible. So that's how I got 21 here. If the determinant of A doesn't equal zero, then A is invertible. And equivalently, all these other things are true. So do you see how this is like a great review of everything we've been learning in the class together? Because, I don't know, it, it takes us back to like row, A's row equivalent to the identity matrix. That takes us back to row reduction. And that's like day one, right? So I hope you found this to be a good review. Like I said, I recommend studying this and like reconvincing yourself why they imply each other. And uh, yeah, in the next video, we're going to talk about eigenvalues I think eigenvectors which is like really important it uses all this stuff because we're going to set the determinant of some matrix equal to zero so that so that ax equals zero has more than just the trivial solution and you're going to see how that comes into play but basically I'm just trying to show you guys that this stuff is important and it comes back all the time and so yeah so I'll cut the video there thanks for watching hope this was helpful